Welcome, Irish fans, to this week's Notre Dame Olympic Athletes edition of the Jack Swarbrick Show. I'm Jack Nolan. On this week's show, we will visit with former Notre Dame athletes and Olympians, fencer Garrick Meinhardt and rowing star Amanda Polk. Now, we take this show late on Thursday night to accommodate the schedules of our Olympians, so James Onwalu is taking the night off to rest up for the Stanford game. But despite a busy week with games this past Sunday and midterm softball star Rachel Naslin has made it here to handle the co-hosting duties later on in the show with Jack Swarbrick. But we're going to get it started. Jack and I having a, a little chat here with some hot topics among Notre Dame fandom. And one of them is why did Notre Dame play North Carolina State in a hurricane yeah. last Saturday? And I've, I've seen some of the postings on social media that Jack Swarbrick should have stepped up and said, my team will not play in these conditions. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way, does it? Well, it didn't in this case. I mean, there's circumstances where it might. So there were, there were a couple of factors that played into it. In, in the week leading up to it, um, starting on Sunday, we had daily conference calls with with the conference, NC State, um, and in some cases, governmental officials trying to sort of analyze what was happening, what might happen, and um, in fact, work through the the logistics of potentially moving it to Sunday. And and that's the sort of decision you've got to make at least 48 hours out. Because there are people, a host of different folks, traveling to come to the game to either watch it, work at it, public safety people, the officials, of course. And on Thursday, the forecast was pretty promising. We, we were, we, on Monday and Tuesday, we thought we can't play this game on Saturday. And by the time we got to Thursday, especially Thursday morning... The, 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 the best information we had was that the hurricane would hit the Florida coast and then head back out uh, toward the east. And while we would get rain, the thought was it would be somewhere as low as two inches and not more than five with wind gusts that were, frankly, not particularly notable. And so with that information, um, we sort of set in motion the plan to play the game. Even Friday morning, the forecast wasn't, it had gotten worse, but it wasn't that bad. So we boarded the plane and we went. And at that point, you really are fairly committed. Um, and, and we had an, a, an interesting dynamic here in that we knew there were other games being played in the area. UNC was hosting a game at Chapel Hill. Uh, Wake was playing a little further away, of course, in, in Winston-Salem. But especially the Chapel Hill game, knowing that was going on as well. And so um, we found ourselves in a position where uh, the options were not great. Um, we had set in motion the, the sort of the, the events that caused everyone to be there and uh, felt fairly committed to, to try and play the game. Now, having said that, we believed and, and had been sort of led to believe that the field would drain better than it did, and it didn't. And, and so... You know, the rain and the wind uh, alone, I think even reflecting on it, I'd, I'd probably make the same decision. If I knew the playing surface was going to be the way it was, um, we probably would have stuck with the Sunday alternative earlier in the week. But we didn't know that. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Uh, the football staff did a great job of, of both analyzing it and preparing for it. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, when you get there and everybody's there, there's a pretty strong commitment to play. And once you kick off, it's the official's decision. You're no longer in, in, in charge. Now, I want to make it really clear to everybody listening. In no way are we, by starting our show with this topic, implying that the reason Notre Dame lost the game was because of the, the weather conditions. Uh, but I know I tweeted out in the first half. I don't tweet a lot during games. But I didn't want anybody to say later, well, you're just saying that because Notre Dame didn't win. NC State's very good. They're 4-1. They were 21st in the nation in defense and offense. They very well at home. On the, ironically, the 50th anniversary of the opening of their stadium right. could have won that football game. But, I, but what I was concerned about was really with how important these games are and how hard everyone prepares to play them. Neither team could play football. That would be great for Thanksgiving morning with the family out in the yard just having fun. But neither team was able to play legitimate football in that game. So explain a little bit more. Notre Dame's a partner with the ACC, even though you're independent in football. 
who has the final say, or is this collectively because of the relationship of all the parties, you kind of get together and discuss it and come to a group decision? I mean, could you have said two hours before the game, I just don't think we should play? The teams have the first opportunity to have that discussion, and if the teams can't reach ag- agreement, in this case it would have been referred to the conference office. And in, as I said earlier, the conference office was engaged throughout the week in our discussion. So because it wasn't truly a conference game, I mean, in the, in, in the instance of a true conference game, the SEC game between Florida and LSU being an example, the conference is, is exercising that control. The sort of sequence here is the two schools first, if they can't reach agreement, the conference gets to play a role since – we're not affiliated with the conference. We would have been in discussions with the ACC directly about this. And then, as I said, once the game started, the officials. So our independent status makes this a little different. I mean, there isn't a really clear answer to your question. And uh, it complicated it a bit. We learned a lot from it. Um, I understand people who think, um, you know, we, we, we should have taken a different position in it. But the, the point you raised is important, that, that, that no one here believes that, you know, it's the reason for the outcome of the game. Both teams played in those conditions. It wasn't football. Um, no. which, which made it complicated. It was really entertaining if you didn't have a vested interest. That's right. And the other thing I, I, I want to stress is um, it, it doesn't produce a safety concern. Um, in, That's it, a good point. In, yeah. in, in fact, it, it's, it's, while it's it not safer. football, it's safer. Um, nobody's cleats are going to grab the, the grass and you're going to hurt an, uh, a knee. No one can get enough plant and momentum to hit you hard enough to deliver a concussion. Um, when you fall, it's like falling on a pillow because it's mud. So at, at no point were we indifferent to the safety of the students. We understood those conditions, as miserable as they were, did not present a safety risk. And the only risk that was possible was lightning, and you had a delay for that. We did have a delay so for that. everybody was protected. Yeah. Do you think long-term, because football has this tradition of playing in whatever weather condition, 20 below, a blizzard. This was unique, a, a hurricane. But you've kind of pointed out that the major problem, and one of the reasons Notre Dame might have been throwing when people thought they should be running, was one side of the field seemed to have an inch to two inches of standing water. If that wasn't the case in the future, same situation, do you think the same decision would be made if – you didn't know there was a drainage problem? And if you did know there was a drainage problem, probably a different situation, it w- a different decision would have been made. Yeah, if the field had played better, I, I, I frankly don't think this is much of a discussion. I mean, we, we, we've played in gustier conditions. It rained more at Clemson. Clemson was wetter last year. Um, but but the, the field here was the dynamic that really produced a different result for us. And and, and, and just as I said earlier, just just added a dimension to the game that – that, that, that took away things that are sort of central to a football game. Um, normally in wet weather, uh, the offense has a significant advantage in passing. But because of the field, you couldn't get separation from anybody. Everybody was running at, you know, 50% speed. And, and so that, that normal advantage you get in wet weather just disappeared. And the one other difference was the footballs, at least at Clemson, were dry because when you put them on the field, the field had drained better here. Not only were they wet, they were put down in an inch of water so that you could not keep the footballs dry. Yeah, and, and you just you, you had places on that field where um, you, couldn't do, you couldn't make any traditional move. It impacted snapping. It impacted running. Um, you know, going laterally was impossible. No one could, go, no one could run laterally because you could, never, you, you could never get out there and turn a corner. But it did impact. It impacted both teams, didn't determine the winner. And the bottom line is Notre Dame is now 2-4, and four, something that is not acceptable uh, at this university. And, of course, you know in the social media world, uh, there are lots of ADs out there who want to make decisions, hiring and firing, and they wonder uh, what your reaction is right now. And, and I can vouch, I'm just around here and there. Sunday when I went up for the uh, little teleconference, you and Coach were meeting. Wednesday, you and Coach came off. Uh, the field with very friendly but intense conversation. So folks do want to know, what are your thoughts right now on the status of this program and the status of your head coach? Well, uh, you know, as I try to um, stress each time these issues come up in any of our sports, I evaluate the program. 
and you, you, you know, we, we want to win and we want to win championships, but if that's all you're measuring it on, you'll get really bad reads. And so you want to know where your program is. And that's why I attend so many practices. That's why I send, spend so much time with our staff and our players. And my confidence in the program remains very, very high. Um, you, you know, you don't have any of the signs of a program in distress. Some teams, and I'll use the 12 team as an example, have a really remarkable way to win. I mean, they just they win games that maybe they shouldn't. They, they find a way. This team has struggled to find a way. It's been a position to win every game. It has had the ball in its possession with the opportunity to, win, to go ahead or tie at the end of every one of these games. We just haven't quite gotten that done yet. That, that's a pretty small margin. I mean, I'm not, I'm not dismissing it. We don't want to be two and four, but all of the things, and, and there are a host of them that I look at to evaluate pro, the program, I feel very good about. My confidence in Brian is as strong today as it was when we were, you know, on our way to an undefeated season and national championship. I, I, I understand the distress our fans feel, especially in a social media world that, that, that wants every, uh, instant, you know, instant results. But, you know, how many, how many schools in the country have a coach who's taken a team to the national championship game in this decade and to a, to, to, to a, to a January 1 bowl? Um, so, you know, I, I, I take a longer-term view. I love the composition of this team. I love our staff. Um, I wish the results of these games had been different, but they only slightly impact my view of where we are. And you have as good a view, probably the best view of the resources provided uh, and the obstacles. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but athletes here have more responsibilities in a lot of places, including excelling uh, academically. And they graduate on time, which is something that contributes to the fact that this is, and I was surprised. I knew it was one of the youngest teams that I'd been around. It's the youngest team in terms of returning starters since 1972 when freshmen were made eligible once again. So you've got a young team that's still trying to learn how to win. As you look at that big picture in long term, are you seeing everything you want to see to return to success? And I know Coach mentioned he was at Grand Valley State. They had a 5-5 in one season in 1999, and he compared it to now. They played a lot of young people, a lot. And they went on to win 50 of their next 54 games in the following season. So you see a similar situation here. And I'm not predicting yeah. five national championships and that kind of winning, but not, the not, foundation there. Yeah, I mean, I'm just not familiar enough to, to know whether that historical precedent is relevant to us. Uh, uh, again, I'm not, you know, I, I, don't, I don't read um, – so much into this result that it impacts my view any more than I read, you know, than I, than I conclude at the end of an undefeated season that everything's fixed and we're perfect and everything's going to be good. And we'll never lose again. It, it, you, you just can't look at it in those small snapshots. And, and the challenges we face because of the way we approach football are ones I embrace. I love, I want them. Um, we're, we're playing a team this week who has a great record in the past five years of their accomplishments. They, they have been a play or two away from the conference, fo uh, conference football playoff semifinals in a couple of years here. Their ranking has been, I think, generally speaking, in the past five years, second only to Alabama at the end of the year. So, you know, you can do it. They're, they're, they're doing it too. The dynamics do create challenges, but they're challenges we embrace. Our teams are always going to be younger. They're going to be younger for reasons which are all good. One of the reasons is we got very talented guys who have an opportunity to go to the NFL sooner, and that's great. I and mean, ten I, of them went this year. Ten of them went, and I love that. I love, you know, would would we be better if Will Fuller was lining up at the at the wide receiver and C.J. Procise was still with us? And you know, I could go on and on. Absolutely, but. I love that those guys get those opportunities and take them and that we've positioned them to do that. I love that our young men generally are in a position to graduate in three and a half years. And sometimes that means they transfer somewhere else to play. Sometimes in the instance of Steve Elmer, that means they start their other, other life. Um, Which they have an option to do. Corey we, Robinson has actually started it before graduating. Yeah, I, I love that. So we are always going to be a little younger. Um, we are always going to be a little less experienced. 
And we are always going to put demands on our student athletes that some other people don't uh, choose to. And I embrace all of that. It is not a reason we can't win here. We can win with those things. We can win and we can win a national championship. This series this weekend, it's always been an interesting series because it is probably the two academically elite colleges that play uh, championship-level football consistently. For you specifically, as a Notre Dame undergrad and a Stanford Law grad, is this game different for you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it. I have such, you know, everybody's affinity runs principally to their undergraduate institution. And that's true for me. Mine, mine lies here, not just because I work here, but that's the way you feel. But still, I have such an appreciation for both places. I was an RA at both institutions. And if you want to sort of learn about the culture of a place, be an that's RA. That's going to be a fairly small club. That is a small club, I would think. Um, and and so I have great I have great fondness for both places, but but even more than that, I passionately believe that in 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 the world today, where we're having an ongoing conversation about what college athletics should be, and especially what college football should be, these two schools are really important in the example they give. That you can be an elite academic institution, you can play football at the highest level consistently. And you can be successful. And um, that's what makes this game special. In addition to my personal feelings, it's, it's that. It's that it's, you know, in some ways it's a little, a little way some people feel about Army-Navy. I feel about Notre Dame-Stanford. It stands for something much bigger than two rivals meeting. It stands for the proposition that two elite institutions can be very successful at football. Now, you started really your athletic administrative career in amateur sports in Indianapolis, led the Pan Am game. So I know for you it's very special that so many Notre Dame athletes have been going on and not only competing in the Olympics but being very successful in the Olympics. And you're honoring six athletes who were able to – you invited more. Six have been able to make it this weekend who competed in Rio. Just talk about why that is, is so important in the big picture and also why it's important for Notre Dame – to be sending so many athletes to the world's biggest athletic stage. Yeah, it is very important to me. It's it's one of the things I first did when I got here. I was, we were we we, we were coming off an Olympics in my second year here, and I said, "What do we do to honor our Olympians?" And we didn't really have a program. And I said, "Let's let's let's do something with this." Um, in part, it's because I know how hard that is. I worked, I, I represented as an attorney a host of national governing bodies. That was my principal, the principal area of my practice. So I got to know all those athletes. And, and there is no pressure in sport like the pressure of only getting a once in four year shot to make it or not make it. And maybe your entire athletic career only spans one Olympic Games, right? If you know you're at the peak of your career in seven years, and the There's Olympics no in the middle of it, you get another shot. You may never get another shot, and and so it is such it is such the pinnacle of sport in that way that that I admire it for that. But it also speaks to our commitment to have all our sports perform at an elite level. Um, we're really proud of that in Notre Dame. We have 26 sports. And we want to win in all of them. We're not saying, well, let's be really good in football and basketball and hockey and a couple of others, and then we'll, we'll not worry so much about our other sports. Our commitment is to every student who decides to come compete here to give them the resources and the ability to reach their dreams, whatever they are. Some of them want to make a professional league. Some of them want to be an Olympian. Some of them want to just achieve a personal best or get on the field. Whatever it is they want to do, our obligation is to put them in a position where they can do that as the broader university's obligation is for the young man or woman who wants to go to med school or Wall Street or the boardroom to put them in a position to do that. And so I'm really proud that we've been able to do that, and I'm incredibly proud of the people who represent us by 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 representing a country in the Olympic Games. And I know we are delighted that we have a couple of those Olympic athletes with us here for this week's show. Rachel Naslin will... Step into my seat for the remainder of the show, and when we come back, we will talk with Notre Dame rowing star Amanda Polk. Stepping onto that field, letting your teammates rushing around you, fans, the bright lights, it's incredible. The shot from McGowan, and she scores! And 
We know that there's no easy games throughout the season. Every game, it's gonna be a fight. Great footwork. Little makes the diving save. It's like this team is a family. You're playing for something that's bigger than yourself. Our first guest on this week's show made Notre Dame history when she became the first Fighting Irish rowing alumna to earn an Olympic medal when she helped the U.S. women's eight win gold in Rio. Amanda Polk has spent seven seasons as a member of the U.S. women's rowing team and was part of the U.S. women's eight boat that set the world record at the World Rowing Cup. She is also the most decorated rower in Notre Dame history. A four-time All-American at Notre Dame, she served as team captain in 2008 and was a key member of the 2006 team that earned Notre Dame's first bid to the NCAA championships. Currently, Amanda is pursuing career opportunities in South Carolina while preparing for a Thanksgiving weekend wedding to Eric Soboleski, an assistant professor at Furman University. They'll be married in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, and we're so happy she stopped by to visit with us this week. So which is a bigger deal, the Olympics or the wedding? It's hard to tell, really. I mean, look at this jewelry. You have this, Man. and then you have this. <laughs> How do you decide? Which is more valuable? And for those of you listening on radio, we got a side-by-side -side comparison of the Olympic gold medal from Rio and the engagement ring, both of which are blinding. <laughs> um, so congratulations on both. Thank you, thank you. I do say that Eric is, is my other gold medal. So uh, I got him first, and that, that helped me get the Olympic one. You know, I, um, I I don't think you and I have ever talked about this, but I represented United States Rowing for the better part of 15 years as their attorney. No, you haven't. Yeah, and so I was I was at Olympics with them and uh, was around the program a lot, and they weren't any close to being as good as you guys are now. You guys are the dominant team. I mean, you know, going into the Olympic Games, this was like, oh, yeah, American women are going to win, you know, because they're so good. How, how did the program... How did you help get the program in, in this place? Well, um, I actually started 15 years ago, so we just missed each other. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with that being said, I mean, it's been a long journey, and I think that Title IX has helped a lot of young women uh, find opportunities in rowing at the D1 level. I know that's where I found my place and my passion in rowing the sport. Um, and from then, it just kind of evolved into national team um process and then senior team and then Olympic team and I really do think that the United States women's rowing program has really grown over the last eight years um, that I've been involved with at least even just the senior team right. and my journey to the Olympics so it's pretty incredible because the athletes that are coming in now I remember coming back from 2012 um, thinking to myself oh man these younger girls they got nothing on me but at the same time these girls came in hot they were stronger than I I was my after I graduated and I really do think that each generation is just getting better and better so I took it upon myself to step up my game to make sure I, I stayed with them and in the end I, I grew a lot and uh, really learned a lot about myself what was it like rowing on such a large stage like uh, it was I can't incredible imagine. Um, so the awesome thing about it is that you don't think it's that large of a stage because you do the sport day in, day out. You practice like you play. Um, that's one of my favorite little quotes that I like to tell my teammates. You know, what we put in, the intensity we put in every day is going to help us in the end. And a race is just going to feel like another practice because we push ourselves and help one another. And that's how we grew close together. And that's how we built the trust among the nine women that we had in the boat. And so for us, it obviously was the Olympics. It obviously was a huge deal. But at the time and in the moment, we were just focused on what we were going to do, the nine of us. And um, our stroke, Amanda Elmore, she actually even said to us, um, which I'm sure she didn't uh, tell too many people this, but um, the night before the race, she actually said, you know, I would do this race off the cameras with you guys and give everything to each and every one of you. And that was, that was our goal. It was, you know, this was for each other. Um, this was um, our journey and kind of the pinnacle of our sport where we took off and we took advantage of the opportunity we were given. Did you guys face any um, large obstacles in that environment in Rio, like with the course or anything? 
Um, so there were a couple days where the course was closed because the wind was so high. Um, the waves, it just made it unrowable conditions. So there were days we had to alter and change our schedule and our training schedule. But, um, you know, our coach was very good and reassuring us that we just have to stick to the plan, stick to the training. You know, everyone in the regatta is facing the same conditions. So we're going to handle it better than everyone else. And our team did an incredible job. Now, how much is the team together in the course of the year leading up to the Olympics? So I was, I've been with the, the last group of girls for the last four years, and some of them eight years. Um, it is definitely a long time with each other. So our training camp is the big boat training camp, which um, out comes the eight, the women's eight, and also the women's quad. Uh, so you're in this camp all year round going um, – you know, being selected, um, challenging each other, constantly competing with each other for a seat and one of these large boats. So, I mean, we're talking about a year long process. And even when we go out, so our base tramp, our base camp is in uh, Princeton, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and we're there primarily um, in the year. But then in, except when you go to California, exactly, except when we go to California, which we cannot complain. We almost skip over winter because our lake freezes and we go to the Chula Vista training sure. center. Um, and out there, it's sometimes it's even more of a challenge because we are eating together, sleeping together, rooming together. I mean, right on top of each other, walking to and from. Whereas in Princeton, we have a little bit more freedom from each other. You know, we all have separate housing situations. But, um, but then it also builds a camaraderie where you realize these girls are incredible women and you get to know them off the water and you realize, you know, what you're really doing as it, it becomes a sisterhood, which is a great dynamic team and great environment to be in. There must be some really tough choices involved in forming that final sisterhood though, right? I mean, there must be some women you grow close to that ultimately don't make the eight. This is very true. This is definitely one of the hard parts because our group is about 26 to 28 girls at one time. And, you know, just if you just focus on the eight, um, because it's a different type of rowing, sweep rowing versus the sculling, they're even, the pool is even just that much str uh, smaller. So you're right. You're competing against your best friend for a spot, um, but you would like to think that at the end of the day, it won't ruin your friendship. Um, we try to keep it very professional and what happens on the water is nothing personal against anyone you know we're all trying to reach our own goal and uh, try to build the team up and I'm a firm believer and you know the team is only as strong as you know the bottom person and the bottom person is ridiculously strong there so <laughs> I felt like there was no weak link uh, but you're right it, it definitely causes some tension at times uh, that makes it difficult to kind of overcome but Luckily, I think that we were all pretty mature enough that we can set it aside and realize, you know, we all have a common goal and we're going to push each other. Um, leading up to the games, you know, we were hearing about Zika virus mm -hmm. and the condition of the water. A number of athletes and other sports chose not to participate. Uh, any of that a concern for you as you contemplated going to the games? I honestly wasn't concerned about it. And um, I will say that, I mean, my focus was the rowing and whatever came with that and taking care of myself in order to perform to that level and so that I could peak at the right time. Um, with that being said, our US, medical, US rowing medical staff was excellent in um, forming a protocol for us. Uh, for instance, you know, we drank out of bottled water the entire time we're there, including brushing our teeth. We had Ziploc bags uh, in the boats with us that made sure the water bottles didn't get splashed. Um, I honestly got splashed a couple times. I did not burn. There was no burning <laughs> sensation. Uh, so it, it was okay. I think Rio actually did a very good job, at least from the venue that I was at, and kind of cleaning it up and making it safe. And um, it made for a really great Olympic Games. I was down there for about a week and went to a lot of venues, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, for all the sort of angst in advance, I thought uh, the people of Brazil did a great job, um, organized the games effectively. It all sort of worked, and yeah, credit to them. Absolutely. How, how did the rowing journey start for you? How did you, how did you become a rower? 
Okay, well, I originally was a basketball player, believe it or not. You know, I'm, I'm six foot, just under. I want that extra have a quarter <laughs> inch always, so I just say six foot. Um, but I started as a basketball player, and I was considering doing a different sport in the off season. And my friend, Cox and Bryce Pachowski, in high school, introduced me to the sport and sort of said, you know, hey, you're really tall, you're really strong, maybe you want to consider this as an alternate uh, sport, you know, while you're in the off season for basketball. So I did, I tried it. And my very first time I did the rowing stroke, it was actually during an indoor rowing machine, which if there are any rowers out there that understand what that the means, erg. the erg, it, it is, is the awful. Worst. <laughs> I've had to do it. Uh, and I'm not even a rower. And it was, it's tough. Yes. It's a love hate relationship for us rowers as yeah, well. I bet. <laughs> But um, as I had my first indoor erg rowing race, and after that, it was mainly when I got on the water with the other, uh, with my other teammates and high school friends that I just it just took off, and it was really um, I guess clear to me when I got a phone call after an indoor erg race asking me if I wanted to try out for the national team, for the junior national team. And at that time, I had no idea that there was such a thing. And so my mouth dropped. I, I couldn't believe this guy. Uh, Steve Hargis was his name, Coach Steve Hargis. He basically taught me how to row well um, because I lost a lot of basketball shorts out there on the Pittsburgh, <laughs> <laughs> on Allegheny and, and uh, Mong. Oh, it's crazy. But um, so I got into the sport there, and I remember – uh, I still didn't know what I was getting into until I went to the Junior World Championships in Bignole, Spain in 2004. And sitting at the starting line, I heard the starting commands, Germany ready, France ready, United States of America ready. And I got chills throughout my whole body. And I said to myself, this is what I want to do. This is what I meant to do. I want to represent the United States in this sport. And it took off from there. I came to Notre Dame and tried to, attempted to help build the team, uh, win a national championship. We did get our first team berth, which was awesome. I was so glad that I was a part of that. And then uh, continued to do some senior national uh, and under 23 national team camps and uh, world championships. Who would have thought that it was the ERG? I that know. that I drew know. you in and then got you to the Olympics. I know. And you know, it's, a, it's an interesting sport because I remember one of my high school friends' moms asking me because she saw my hands. My hands were just a mess with <laughs> blisters and calluses. And she said, Amanda, why are you doing this? And I looked at my hands. I'm like, it's, um, it, it's fun. fun. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> She's like, where's the fun in that? I was like, you have to be on the water. It's just an experience that is just indescribable. She's like, yeah, I think I'll stay on land. <laughs> How much does the game change from college level to Olympic U.S. level? Honestly, I really feel like each level I just took another step up. So it was a really great per progression for me. Um, you know, from high school to college, I learned a ton about myself, about being a good teammate, about just an at and what it takes to be a good athlete and student because I – Balancing and time management was so critical in college. I remember graduating and being like, I'm just so <laughs> thrilled that I was able to get all of it in because our, I mean, a student athlete is very difficult, especially at the, the high standards at Notre Dame. And uh, since then, from then, I, I took another kind of step up and I didn't have the classes anymore. So I could focus just on training and taking care of myself and doing a little research on like what it takes for good nutrition and whatnot to be at the senior level. Um, then when 2012 happened uh, and I was the alternate, it was disappointing for me for sure because leading up to it, I was in some very fast eights and very fast lineups. But um, coming back and looking at that and then realizing I – I feel like the London journey to the present, it's a completely different 
person. Like I just, my game was stepped up so much more and that's what I needed. I needed to push myself more than I ever had before. And some of that attests to just the strong group in Princeton that I was a part of. And some of it was that I think through that failing for me, I had to find another level of strength that was going to get me in that boat and to win that gold. I, I have a theory that there's there really isn't anything comparable in sport to eight people being in perfect synchronization and the boat starts to fly. You know when that when that really happens. I mean, that's a, that must be such a unique feeling. It really, really is. And I think that that feeling is why I was so passionate about it. You know, you do a lot, a lot of strokes together. And once you get the boat up to speed, it's, it's almost like a joy ride. Yeah. But you're, you're the machine. You're the motor that's making this happen along with these eight other women. And um, I can share with you that during our final um, – the first thousand we were down, which was slightly unusual for us. We usually have a slight lead, at least in the first 500. And it was incredible because there was no waiver in confidence or trust among the eight women. Now, you're probably wondering, well, like, how can you even tell that? When you sit behind someone for so long or in front of someone, you can feel the dynamic. It's just an un it's a very nonverbal communication but then our coxswain right at the thousand um, she made a call that said we are the United States women's eight and all of a sudden you felt this electric surge mm. go through the boat and the next thing we heard was we have six seats up it was incredible I mean I'm still getting chills talking yeah. about it um, just because like the like you said the unison that we had and the trust that we had it's you really can't describe what you feel um, unless you're in it. So it's it's definitely a memory that will be with me forever. Your impact on our program was alluded to in the introduction. It's been significant, but you know now it's manifest in a physical plant that's a little different than what you what you rode in when you were here. Have you had a chance to be at the boathouse yet? I have not yet. I'm looking forward to it, though. I've seen pictures and seen some uh, short videos. It looks absolutely stunning. I can't wait. I apparently have a locker there that Coach Stone surprised me with. He sent me a text and said, hey, look at this. And I said, how did I get that? And he said, did you look at the, at the title? It says Amanda Polk, Olympic champion. That's how you got it. <laughs> I said, oh, well, whose stuff is in it? And he goes, uh, nobody's, it's yours. So he was trying to, I, I just, it didn't hit me. It was just like, okay, but that's not my boathouse, you know, sort of thing. But it's incredible. I'm really excited to I see it. I can't wait for you to see it. We're really proud of it. Thank it's a, you. It's, it's a great facility, and you helped in a very specific way to build it. Is there another Olympics in you? That is to be determined. It's really tough right now because I have a lot of life, uh, life things happening. She has to focus happening. on her wedding. Focusing I on my wedding. That. She yeah. has to focus on her I wedding. Know. She spent the whole year <laughs> winning a gold medal. Well, and what's so awesome is that coming back and celebrating with your family and friends that you've lost touch with or you haven't been able to visit just because training for us is 24-7. There's, you know, maybe like seven days out of the whole year that you feel like, okay, I can maybe breathe one day. Um, especially every year it gets a little bit tougher, but, uh, but yeah, it's really nice and we'll see. It's to be determined this year. I think I'm just going to focus on life decisions, um, outside of the athletic realm, but obviously still stay in shape just in case. <laughs> <laughs> well, best of luck. Congratulations on all your success. I, Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I hope your wedding is a spectacular day. I'm involved in planning one of those myself and oh, my daughter these to days. Oh, you. So sign the wow. band, sign the band contract and the all bus the contract bride today. And a future bride here. Yeah, yeah. So so, but uh, we, we are so proud of you. Thanks for thanks for what you've done to put Notre Dame's rowing program on the map, but especially to help build the the juggernaut that the Olympic the U.S. Olympic team is. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate. it. Love coming back to the alma mater. Thank you. We'll be back in a minute. You use the crowd's energy and it really just pumps me up, pumps my team up. 
Just to have your emotion tighten your stomach, it's a nervous, excited feeling. It gets your adrenaline pumping. All right, let's bring it, Irish. Defense wins this game. Work for each other, play for At that other. moment in time, we all know that we're there for each other. Irish on three, one, two, three. Irish! Our next guest made history as the youngest U.S. Olympic fencer of all time when he competed as a 17-year-old in the 2008 Beijing Games. Garrick Meinhardt just competed in his third Olympics in Rio and earned his first medal when the U.S. men's foil team won bronze. In 2010, he became the first U.S. male to win a senior world championship medal, a bronze, and then became the first U.S. male to win multiple individual senior world championship medals when he won silver in 2015. At Notre Dame, he was a three-time first-team All-American and won the 2010 NCAA Championship in men's foil. He earned a bachelor's degree from Notre Dame in 2013 and an MBA in 2015. Now, Garrick did not have a long way to travel to get here today. He currently works in the Notre Dame Development Office on Eddy Street as the Assistant Director of Prospect Management for the West Region. Welcome, Garrick. You have such a long list of accolades, but um, what I was wondering is, what was it like being 17 years old in an Olympic at the Olympics? Yeah, it was it was an amazing experience. Actually, uh, just being there, being amid, amongst all of those athletes that I'd watched on TV, that I'd looked up to all these years, and the ones that may not have been in the NBA or the the sports that I regularly watch, but I know have just dedicated their whole lives to the sport that put so much into it. Uh, it was amazing being there at 17. To be honest, Beijing relative to London and Rio after that was a little of a blur. I was just, I was there, I was excited. I had to focus on my competition. I put it all out there, I competed. I was the youngest by five years in my event, so I didn't have real hopes at a medal, but it was a great experience. I fought my hardest, finished the event, learned a lot, and flew here to freshman orientation right after. Well, it's crazy to think that most people, their first thing is they're going straight to orientation, and you're <laughs> off traveling to a different country to compete against what you said. I mean, people who are much older than you and that you looked up to, which is just an incredible experience. Yeah, it was cool. I, I got here, we had freshman orientation, watched closing ceremonies together with uh, my <laughs> new roommates and my dorm mates. So they probably was, were a little starstruck, cool. too, being like, I, I'm rooming with uh, an Olympic... Yeah, <laughs> I wish they were starstruck. They, they, <laughs> no, they, they definitely treated me as if I was any other uh, roommate or or doormate, and I'm glad that they did. Uh, three Olympiads. Very few people get to do that. Um, how would you compare them? Is there yeah. are there moments that stand out in one versus another? Definitely in. Beijing at my first Olympics, as I mentioned, it was a little bit of a blur. I don't think I took enough time to really take it in, but also I was I was just so young that there was so much going on. I hadn't experienced it before that I, I couldn't help but be overwhelmed in a way. Uh, as far as the competition went, I took 10th. I had a really strong first match against an Egyptian fencer and then lost to a Chinese fencer who was much more experienced than me, overpowered me, and and won the bout handily. And at that moment in that defeat, I it only motivated me further. I mean, seconds after stepping off the strip, I was excited to continue fencing, to get to Notre Dame, be able to train with such a strong team, be a part of this family, and continue to grow and set my set my sights on London and then Rio after that. And uh, even when London came around, we were still such a young team. I'd been through, I'd, I'd suffered three knee surgeries. Unfortunately, I wasn't 100% during that qualification period, so I only qualified for the team event for London. We took fourth, which was which is always tough, falling short of that medal, falling short of the bronze medal. Um, but we were still the youngest. We hadn't been consistently performing, so even fourth was an accomplishment for us at the time. The next year is when we really uh, jumped to the top of the world rankings and made our presence known. And you know, this it's been amazing to be a part of this growth for U.S. fencing and to be a part of this team that uh, finally made it to the to the podium uh, in my event. Well, uh, again, for those on radio, we uh, we have the great benefit of uh, having the Olympic medal with us, the the bronze medal. And um, is that the capper to your Olympic career? Are you uh, are you done, or is there another Olympiad in front of you? Uh, to be honest, I mention those knee surgeries and the fact that I've been to three already is is something that I'm so grateful for. Uh, after 
uh, being at one, I was, you know, already grateful and honored to have been able to represent the United States. I would have been happy and content with my career. And that's really how I've taken each day. I work hard to improve, enjoy fencing while I'm able to, and, and kind of am appreciative of the fact that despite those injuries, despite, um, you know, the setbacks that I've had and that my competitors have and that all athletes do, I've been able to uh, and have been grateful for each next day. So that's kind of a obscure answer to your question. It, it doesn't look like I'm going for Tokyo to, uh, Tokyo 2020 at this time, but um, I, I haven't fully retired yet. Could change. Could change. Could change. What, um, at what age did you um, start fencing? Like, tell us a little bit about how you got into the sport. Yeah, I started pretty young. I was nine and a half years old. A family friend was actually a three-time Olympian starting up a youth club in San Francisco. So my parents signed me up, thought I'd enjoy it, and they were right. I loved it. There were a lot of kids my age uh, that were there starting at the same time as me, so we grew up together. I would actually go straight from school to uh, my coach's house because his wife taught me piano when I was young, first starting to. That didn't last long. I had to focus on the fencing after a few years, but that's how I got into it and thankfully stuck with it, and things have gone well since. Why Notre Dame? I visited Notre Dame, obviously, when I was 16, the year before I had to make that decision. Uh, and one of the main reasons why I visited in the first place was because of its elite fencing program. I, I knew the coaches at the time. I knew a lot of the fencers on the team. I came and just loved my experience. I, I, I was a recruit there and had an amazing time. I felt like I was already part of the family and everyone wanted me to be there and join that family and uh, I don't regret it at all. Obviously I've, I've loved it and I've continued to feel a part of the family since I stayed for my graduate degree and now I'm working here as well. So, I can't, I, I'm sorry, I can't believe they mentioned you got the MBA and didn't mention that you took Professor Swarbrick's I know. class on yeah. sports media and, I, and the MBA program. I've been <laughs> meaning to sign up for that, actually. <laughs> you uh, but, you, but you didn't. You I know it. Yeah, I heard you're a hard grader. Well, you count the ums, I think, right? Well, we, we, yeah, we, Speeches. We, 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 we are demanding, but uh, it's rewarding, right? Very rewarding, yeah. <laughs> it was really fun. Both of those big projects were fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was an it was an interesting class. Yeah, you know, we talked to Amanda about how the facilities had changed over the time of her sort of span of her Olympic uh, journey relative to Notre Dame's facilities. The fencing facilities are a lot different today than when you started, right? Yeah, it's it's amazing, and people ask why you know what I'm doing at Notre Dame, why development, and it's just, I mean, if if you come and visit our fencing facility and. Uh, luckily, a lot of people are able to. We host several tournaments in, and uh, NCAA competitions each year. The Castellon Family Fencing Center is by far the best in the nation, one of the best in the world, and we're so lucky to have that. And uh, it wouldn't be possible without, you know, how generous uh, everyone is to the university, and uh, our team is so grateful. So as of right now, you're not fencing, but what brought you back again? to Notre Dame to be in our development office. What drew you back in? I couldn't pass up the opportunity to be back, to be a part of this family. I was in San Francisco last year where I grew up working at Deloitte and it was another great, uh, great environment that I definitely uh, am happy that I got to experience and be a part of and learn from. Uh, but the opportunity came up at Notre Dame and I, I couldn't pass it up to return here to be with family, still be involved with the fencing team. Uh, they're contenders again for the national championship and I'm excited I'm going to be a volunteer coach this year and we'll be with them traveling to a bunch of their tournaments. What do you do for development? I'm assistant director of prospect management so I help um, a lot of our fundraisers find interests that um, are in find find and match interests and needs uh, of the university to people who are also interested in those needs of the university, whether it be capital, whether it be professorships, fellowships, and just matching those matching those people with the needs is something that is obviously really important and something that I've enjoyed so far. I'm a month and a half in, and hopefully uh, I've been able to contribute well. <laughs> he said he actually had a day between getting back from the from Rio, from the Olympics, and then coming straight to South Bend. Yeah, I flew Quick from Rio over. to San Francisco, 
finished packing up my bags uh, when I got in midday and then flew to South Bend the next morning. Well, uh, you certainly uh, made a huge difference in our fencing program while you've been here, and I have no doubt you'll have the same impact in a, in a, in a broader role for the university. So we are... We are so fortunate uh, to have you as part of the family, as you as you reference it. The impact uh, that you made on this fencing program is so significant, and uh, we appreciate all that you've done for Notre Dame. And we look forward to having you around here for a long time. Yeah, thanks so much. It's good to be back. Thanks, Garrick. We'll be back in a minute. We represent the greatest university in the world. Let's carry that pride tonight onto this field, and let's play for Notre Dame, and let's play for Our Lady. That's how we're playing today. I don't know what next week holds or the week after or three weeks down the road, but tonight, that's how we're playing this football game. And caught beautifully. What a play. Touchdown, Notre Dame. The Irish find a way. Welcome back to the Jack Swarbrick Show, and here to wrap up another busy week are your hosts, Rachel Naslin and Jack Swarbrick. Welcome back, Rachel. I don't know. You were awfully good this week. Are we going to let James come back? What's the deal? I don't know if he's invited back. <laughs> he, he put his beauty sleep ahead of our show tonight. It can well, be the Jack and Rachel show from now on. Yeah, well, maybe it's, yeah, the Jack and Rachel show with guest appearances by James on Maybe, we, yeah, I was going to say we could throw him a guest also, appearance. Also appearing, James on <laughs> <laughs> I like the also appearing. Well, James was getting his beauty sleep, but uh, he needs a, a really important contest for, for football this week against Stanford. But it's not the only big event going on on campus. Nope. As you pointed out earlier, volleyball has been knocking it out of the park, 6-0 in the the ACC. They have a really important match Friday here against North Carolina. So I will hope, be there. So we hope people be there, join you there. Big crowd to root them on. And at the same time, women's women's soccer against number six North Carolina at Alumni Stadium. So it's a it's a Tar Heel night. Two really important two really important games for two teams that are playing very very well. With uh, with that and some great road events, our, our our number one or two men's soccer team is on is on the road uh, in an important contest at number ten Virginia. That'll uh, give them just one more test in what's been a remarkable year for them. So, a lot going on on campus, a lot to do. Another uh, night football game, which we talked about, changes the uh, dynamic a little bit. Does. So. Uh, be a lot of fun in South Bend this weekend, and so uh, I look forward to seeing you and James next week, and go Irish. Go Irish. 